and welcome back to Literally Literary. If this is your first time joining us, be sure to check out our previous episodes. This episode, we will continue our discussion on Patron Saints of Nothing by Randy Rebuy. Last episode, we discussed the first half of the novel, where we met Jay. After finding out about the happenings in the Philippines, Jay decides to visit family there and finds that he's been so disconnected from them. This episode, we will focus on the second half of the novel. In the second half to Great me, recap. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, catching up readers up uh, if they're just joining us, because I know that we have a lot of new followers. Um, welcome. Yeah, welcome to you all uh, on, on the Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, and uh, like we were saying there, you know, if you want to join us in the studio or uh, if you're unable to because you're not, you know, you're not from, you're not here, uh, you're also welcome to leave a comment a voice message on on any of the or the po- podcast feeds and uh, you just have to create a simple account which is very easy uh, and we could potentially play your comment live um, or at the recording next time around so we welcome those two any yeah. comments or questions on the readings as you're reading along um, but Don't be shy uh, yeah so think about it and uh, you know we want to involve different views you know that's kind of one thing about reading you get all these different views um so i wanted to point you all to page uh so after the the museum bit and um you know tito manin he goes to uh with you know tita chato and um you know living there uh he finds out a lot of different things that he didn't know about uh, June. Um, And so Tita Chato at the end of this chapter is telling them that, you know, you know, yes, you know, you're, you're probably right that he wasn't really a drug pusher that, you know, he wasn't a a bad person, but we have to accept his death. And so he kind of gets disappointed at that because, you know, she's been kind of the foil Right, a foil to Tito Manning. Yeah. Uh, and so on 174, I really like, you know, this line about she's not all that different. Though her words were delivered with more compassion, they were the same. I am, they were the same. I am not truly Filipino, so I don't understand the Philippines. But isn't this deeper than that? Doesn't this transcend nationality? Isn't there a, some sense of right and wrong about how human beings should be treated that applies no matter where you live? no matter what language you speak. Um, this line, this this strong line really uh, hit me because of, um, you know, I think this is something that I personally believe in and I think it, it's it's myopic and um, kind of this insular view of way of looking at things, right? That, you know, just because they're American or just because they're, you know, whatever, right? Class, mm-hmm that therefore uh, they deserve more human dignity than others who aren't, than others who are not like you. Mm. Um, And ultimately, you know, to me, this is all kind of uh, maybe Randy zooming out and speaking to the the way he views things, right, about um, the, the narrator here about, you know, we shouldn't limit ourselves, right? And you were saying, Vanessa, that this was one thing that really opened your eyes about, you know, the Philippines and... You know, reading the news, right, that it isn't just about the U.S. or about the border. Um, so this is why I, I really like this kind of questioning of how even with Tita Chato, who seems, you know, like I said, like she's on his side, mm-hmm. even she has her limits. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah, know if you had a, any thoughts on, on that. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah, I mean, just um, I think that speaks to this kind of global world philosophy that, that um, he, he touches on throughout the book. But, you know, and, and again, again, just based on circumstance, right, like of who you were born, where you were born, which family you were born into, mm-hmm. right, that doesn't, you know, everyone deserves there's something. And I think that's one of the things we'll touch on. I want to talk about later in the book because I think some of the lines connect it all together. Okay. But, yeah, I think that's an interesting experience, right, getting kicked out kind of early, kicked out early enough because mm-hmm. he... He finally confronts Maining. I think that's one of the things that uh, when we ended, when they're visiting the museum, mm-hmm. he, he finally works up the courage to ask. And 
Mm. Um, that doesn't go well. So his stay with with the main with Maining and family uh, ends a little prematurely, and he goes to the you know his, his aunt. Yeah. And um, yeah. So yeah, I think yeah. you had another passage too, right? right yeah, after. I had another one um, right after you know where he sees Yun's room. And um, on 175, and then later on on 177, um, he finds th- his thing. So this is a completely different room, right? So all of this is, the setting is a foil to Tito Manin. And he finds uh, among them, Audre Lord. And I know you're going to talk about, yeah. you know, his work, uh, her work. And, um, uh, but the book that stood out to me was uh, the prison notebooks of, of Antonio Gramsci. Yeah. And uh, I remember reading his work and, um, you know, as a Marxist philosopher, I thought he had really interesting views, uh, particularly about hegemony, Mm -hmm. the way society controls you, the way society controls the population. Uh, I mean, I should say government uh, and politicians. And um, uh, so I thought it really represents, you know, that Yoon is um, very politically conscious. Obviously, from his letters, we already knew that. But he's, you know, he's also informed with scholarship, you know, and um, so very woke, as we would say nowadays. Uh, and so that kind of um, was really interesting to me in terms of finding out more about, you know, uh, what Yoon was like. Um, later on, on, um, on 177, um, we've talked about language a lot, uh, Tagalog and versus English and how he views himself in that relationship, that binary. Uh, I really like this way of this very uh, disruptive, the, the poetic way of describing the, the, the relationship between the two, the difference between the two. English is a language that lives in the middle of the mouth. But Tagalog is more of an open throat song that dances between the tip of the tongue and the teeth. Um, my mouth feels too heavy, too thick, too slow to produce the light, rapid syllables Filipinos spit with such ease. I curse my parents for not teaching me the language when I was young, when the struggle would have seemed more like a fun game than an identity crisis. Um, very, um, uh, you know... Um, gustatory way of, uh, or, you know, um, sensual way of, of describing the way the differences between English and the language that to him is foreign, simply because his parents didn't teach him, you know, when, when he was little, right? And because of this, we see the, the repercussion of him having that um, culture shock and also language shock, you know, not knowing uh, his own home country's uh, language. Um so I, re- I really like that, you know, the, the way that he describes the difference between the two. One is a lot more festive. One kind of just resides in you, you know, um, kind of just reflecting the cultural differences as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but any, any, did you guys have any thoughts on, on the, the language use or maybe later on in another passage? Yeah, I believe we, we touched on that on the previous episode. Uh, yeah, yeah, episode yeah. two. Where we talked about the language and like the way there how he kind of adds it to the corporal like you know te- you know through the, the his body speaking of his tongue and mm-hmm. you know um, I think we both related Vanessa and I a little bit last time of you know feeling mm-hmm. like I speaking of like not being so efficient in my Spanish right I, I get I totally get the whole heavy tongue thing you know mm-hmm. trying to like mm-hmm. pronounce things mm-hmm. the the right quote quote unquote right way yeah. Um, that's that's a really great line. Yeah, you know, that I identified with again, once mm-hmm. again. Yeah, it is perceptive too. You know, uh, of the way that um, <clears throat> he has the what what each language is like. What does it require, right, for you to acquire literacy in, in one and the other? Um, mm-hmm. a little later on, I think this is your passage, Richie, about um, English teachers. Yeah, so that's something that <laughs> I just um you I think you and I and anyone listening who's maybe ever taught any kind of literature uh kind of I laughed at um I I thought it was a, a kind of lighthearted comment moment but also it leads to something more profound. Mm-hmm. So earlier you were talking about uh 
Actually, let me see the book because I don't. Yeah, uh, 179. Yeah, one seventy nine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one seventy nine. Bottom of the page. Um, you you know he's talking about. So, one thing he discovers just to kind of add a little bit of exposition because mm-hmm. I think it helps sometimes if you're if you're listening along. Yeah. Right. He finds out that June did live with this Tita Tita Chat. Chato for mm-hmm. a little bit. No, Chata. Chato. Chato, yeah. Yeah. That's I was thinking I keep thinking of. Mm. Um He finds out that June lived lived with her for a little while. Yeah. Her and her, her partner. Yeah. And um of course once he's left, he's left a bunch of books which are um, you know, I would call radical, right? You mentioned Gramsci uh-huh. and even Audrey Lord. And so one of my favorite points is when he's um, looking through through them, and he's you know he's looking through the books, and he talks about reading through them and and falling in love with the language, reading words out loud, um, and he makes this little comment, and, you know he says not like how English teachers do, where they basically try to get you to guess what they think it means, but like how I know he would have like he generally wanted to know my thoughts, so he's talking about how. His, the connection that he saw June would have with other people, one of the things that attracts June, you know, June to Jay, is how he's curious in people, like genuine, genuine, genuinely, authentically curious about them, and that's that's a power in him. And so he kind of makes this comment about, and I think that also kind of speaks to the dichotomy of uh, which you see happening all throughout, where he compares his life at home as a regular high school student and then and coming to the Philippines he's kind of often comparing so there's this little comment of like he's imagining English class where the teacher is trying to you know go through a passage and like mm-hmm. no no but what does it mean mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. you know and then really I, I laugh because you know sometimes I, I navigate try to navigate conversations or discussions towards a certain way mm-hmm. I'm sure you do as well mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and, and while you're on that same note, Vanessa, what about you as a as a as a yeah. English major student? Do you feel that that kind of uh, hit you there as far as how you feel sometimes the way that professors are? Or? No, not re- I mean, not really. I've always had like professors that are kind of like curious in what the students have to say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I always get a lot of different perspectives. That's good. That's good. That's good. So, you know, it starts out with this, this moment, and and this is towards the end of the chapter, mm-hmm. and he's reading Audrey Lord's work. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, if you're not familiar with, with her, definitely check her out. She's, you know, radical uh, in the sense of uh, liberating, feminist, um, very powerful words, some of the best that I've read. And um, <clears throat> he's reading one of her poems, A Litany for Survival. And even though he feels that way about kind of reading, like he, you get that attitude, the way he makes that comment about the teacher trying to get them to guess what they think. He has his own personal teaching experience in which he has just read and he experienced it on his own. And it really hits him towards the page 180, then the chapter, the very last paragraph there. Um, he talks about reading the poems and he says, I've never been a big poetry fan. But these are blowing me away. Why don't we ever read this kind of stuff in school? Then I reach a litany for survival. And my God, there's nothing I can do after finishing it beside close the book, stare at the ceiling, and soak in the words. This poem is a typhoon. We're doing this podcast because we love reading. You mm-hmm. guys are listening to us because you probably love reading. I think all of us have had these kinds of moments mm-hmm. where... There's not much we can do except just sit down mm-hmm. and and soak it in, mm-hmm. think about it, and and so if you're not familiar with that poem, "A Litany for Survival," um, definitely recommend you check it out. It is available for free online, and uh, I think one of the things that really catches them with this poem mm-hmm. is you know these opening lines kind of reflect where he's at right now in his life and his kind of quest for truth. And and uncertain of what has really happened to June, what kind of life he has gotten himself into and how he ended up dying. It's still a mystery, right? Mm-hmm. So I think he's filled with all these questions. The opening lines of that poem is addressed. For those of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, 
crucial and alone. And it just kind of goes on. And that's the power in language and words to connect us, mm-hmm. to have us thinking about these big questions. Even if we don't know the answers, sometimes it starts with asking the right questions, right? The big questions. And so, you know, it also introduces, in, in many ways, this imagery of water that I think Jay ends up throughout the rest of the book speaking of about drowning the flood. And it has a lot to do with identity. Mm-hmm. It has a lot to do with like figuring out just where he is culturally as, again, American, Filipino, Filipino-American, however you want to put it, hyphenated, non-hyphenated. Mm-hmm. You know, the, these issues of identity. So I, this was one of my powerful moments because, again, this is through the power of poetry. And uh, mm-hmm. he's got this big task ahead of him. And so we continue with the book. And and the uh, the the illusion there is is coming from also um, it's it's kind of a, itself a reference back to Jung, right? Because mm-hmm. that's the from his connection that he had, and like, again, it kind of just speaks to you know Jung, and it reminds yeah. me a lot you all of, of Khalil, you know, because of how it's very similar that like we lose like mm-hmm. all of that, right? And we have to get all this story after the fact Mm -hmm. you know and it's like the tragedy of like how much has been lost by someone who clearly was gonna be something right and round i mean it definitely rounds out of of, you know fland character fland image Mm -hmm. a lot of this book takes that to task right how Mm -hmm. what we know Mm -hmm. and what's really there and so yeah these these collection of books and the things he left behind yeah say a lot to june's character but also i think you know, like I said, their relationship, you know, they were already so close. So I think they agree with a lot of these things. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, it, it's part of uh, uh, Jay's awakening as well, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you know, his self-discovery about what what side is he going to take on? And before we get to your passage, Vanessa, I, there's a couple more real briefly that struck me about the room and I, I guess you know i have this obsession with like the possessions and stuff but um the way that the house is on 183 uh tita chato and tita ines's house is filled with images of all of us there are lots of photographs of tita chato and tita ines doing things like walking on the beach a couple of lola and lolo shots of my parents you know etc and this is in contrast to tito manning had Basically, no such pictures except for one of those awkward studio shots. Mm-hmm. Mine is Yoon that hangs in the living room. And uh, so really sharp contrast again between the kind of relationship Yoon had, you know, and it kind of speaks to truth again, right? And it's, again, something that we'll come back to at the end of, no- of the novel. But, you know, that you don't get – you if you just go by Tito Manning's narrative, right, his um, – grand narrative as he would might consider it you know you it's a it's very um you know it's all about like we had said you had said last time richie erasure right and that it's it's also this idea of a studio shot right it, it's um uh not rehearse but what's the word for that um you know um it, it, there's a there's a lack of authenticity right in a studio shot like everything is mm. is like choreographed right mm-hmm and uh, uh posed you know uh, but here everything is real you know and everything has been preserved as it should be and i think that's very important you know when someone mm-hmm. passes like you know again we talked about with khalil right mm-hmm. um so the other thing is is the definition of a reporter and i i really resonated with this because um i myself was a reporter for you know the for a college report uh, correspondent and you know this idea of a good reporter is in an, uh, the sign of a good reporter is an unhealthy obsession with the truth mm-hmm. on 184 and of course this is something that uh, Jay himself you know really connects with and and kind of represents him right he is basically taking on this reportage of of Yoon 
his relative, you know, to dig up that truth. In some cases, ex- of course, exposing himself to this kind of danger, right, of am I going to get involved with that myself? Uh, so just those two, you know, that also hit me. Uh, but a little later, Vanessa, you had one on, t- uh, what was it about? It's where, so Jay and uh, Mia go to the slums and they meet Reina. Mm-hmm. Um, so it starts around page 202. And that whole, I think it's one chapter. Mm-hmm. But from like 202 to 216 is um, Mia and Reina talking about June and what kind of person he was and how he helped everybody or he tried to help help everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Mia kind of translates it for Jay. And so mm-hmm. I just found that that part was really interesting and like discovering more about who June was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, more more of the truth, right? Mm-hmm. Um, was there a particular strong line from that chapter that kind of um, tied in that that concept of you know how he's um, the 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 translation what was interesting, right? That you know again it kind of shows that. Uh, cultural limitation on his part that he was kind of picking up a word here and there, right? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Or what is it about Yoon that we find out that we didn't know before through Reina? Well, rather through mm-hmm. Mia, who's translating from mm-hmm. Reina. We find out um, why June ran away from Tita Chato's place also. Why? To help Reina. And the idea that he was a drug pusher, right, is again um, denied. Up, yeah. Yeah, brought up and denied, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. um, by Reina. So it's when June runs away again from Tita Chato's place. It's on, it's on page 208. Um, so we, we've we kind of found out a little bit about Reina at this point, And we find out that she stayed at Tita Chato's place for a little while as well, while they tried to help her get on her feet. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when she become, she starts working for a family and they're mistreating her and she doesn't want to bother Tita Chato again because she's already been helped and she doesn't want to take that help that could be used for someone else. So she decides to just take it for a good while until she decides it's been too much. And so she calls Tiza Chato, but the one that answers the phone is June. Mm. So I'm going to start reading a part, a part of it. Mm. Soon, soon as the call was answered, she said her emotions were like rushing water over a burst dam. She started talking, confessing everything that the husband had done to her as if they were her own sins. But when she stopped speaking, she realized it was not Tita Tita Chato, at the end of the other line, but June. She felt overwhelmed with shame that she had told him what she had, but he only asked where she was. She told them the address of the house, and he was on the doorstep an hour later. So I I really like that part because um, we get to see how much he's willing to help. Like, he didn't judge her. He didn't not do anything. He didn't just be like, oh, well, I'll tell my aunt when she gets home or something. Mm -hmm. He went, and he was the one to help her. Yeah, more more of his, you know, um, selflessness and, mm-hmm. you know, um, the dramatic irony there, you know, um, not knowing it's, it's June who's listening. And, and and just overall, you know, the, the, the setting, right, of, of the quote-unquote slum, I thought was interesting that, um, you know, we have this conception of a slum, I think in in popular culture that it's mm-hmm. like you know ridden with crime and drugs, right? And and so mm-hmm. here it kind of just sheds light on on what kind of of, of what a, what is what a quote unquote slum really is, mm-hmm. right? That mm-hmm. you know it's just people who are neglected by society or out, outcasted, you know, for whatever reason, and they're really just trying to make a living, but because of the way society views it. You know, uh, the, the, um, it becomes more and more difficult, right, to be accepted. 
just for who you are, you know, just for maybe one mistake you made in your life, mm -hmm. right? Um, Sometimes victim of circumstance, like that's not even your beyond your control. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And also um, from a purely writing standpoint, I love the way his description as they're walking through the slums. Mm. I think I mentioned this last time, uh, or maybe it was I was off the podcast, but mm. um, you know, if I were teaching uh, a creative writing course and talking about sensory, the use of sensory language, mm -hmm. I think it does a really great job when they're first entering. He's kind of describing the the smells and the sights, the sounds that he's he's experiencing. Yeah, um, it it is it is very sensory, you know, and I think uh, it, 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 part of it is because of the contrast that he draws, you know, between where he was with Tito Manin and, mm -hmm. and Tita Chato, and now, you know, and and here with Reina. Um, and then I just love that opening that once again reflects the, um, Randy's um, structure, you know, the, the line that goes back to the title of the chapter, right? In that universe, people do not die for doing what is right. Imagining where you and is still alive, married to Reina, and they have a daughter, you know, who feels like a niece to me. Uh, and so him, you know, I, I, it's part of that processing June Steph and the, what could have been you know the I think we all wonder that of course when when a loved one passes I had one a little later on on 226 I don't know if someone had one before no um no I just had 227 okay okay well it, it goes <laughs> yeah. into that so we could exactly tag team it um so this is a um well, I'll, I'll read it first, and I'll talk about it because it's got a little long. Uh, but so this is uh, Jay speaking, uh, the narrator. But standing here with my feet in the water, listening to the sound of Tagalog and maybe other languages mixed with laughter and the crashing of the waves, smelling the chicken in a salt or pork in a hall, grilling behind me as swallows flit past overhead to their nest high in the surrounding cliffs. I feel like that first year mattered in a way I've never felt it did before. Surely the air your lungs first breathe matters, the language your ears first hear, the foods your nose first smells, and your tongue first tastes, the soil you first call upon. My conscious brain might not remember, but something in me does. Uh, and then at the bottom, it strikes me that I cannot claim this country's serene coves and sun-soaked beaches without also claiming its poverty its problems, its history. To say that any aspect of it is part of me is to say that all of it is part of me. And man, to me, this like was such a beautiful passage. Like, um, it, it, it's so rich in its description, you know, the, the, the end, the, the point that he makes as well, you know. And so um, first, it's, it's to me, it, it's this idea, as he said it better, that... You know, something about your first whatever, right? That it just, it, 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 it is congenital to you in some sense. Um, mm -hmm. Inborn or kind of becomes part of your DNA, uh, even if you don't recall it. You know, so something gets ingrained in you, right? And so later on, you know, you just have that feeling where like, I've it's kind of like deja vu, right? Like a sen sensory de deja vu. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I really like that as far as how sometimes you might feel disconnected from the world. That there's always that first thing, whatever language, food, you know, that brings back something. Yeah. Even if you, if you have like a blurry photograph on your head uh. that isn't quite there. Um, and the idea also that when it comes to the Philippines that, yes, there's beauty there, but you also have to take it all together right you have to swallow it whole in terms of the the whatever corruption that might be in this case with the president whatever problems it might have and the poverty as well you know which we just saw in the last chapter um i i also find interesting when when we zoom out of that and think about you know the u.s and mexico right like there's of course beautiful parts in it but we can't just claim that for you know, and just say that is America, right? It's also like you got to take it whole. And that's the way I see teaching writers that, 
you know, a lot of writers have mystery histories, controversial backgrounds, you know, yeah. um, like H.P. Uh, Lovecraft is a neo-Nazi, right, uh, basically, and uh, very popular. Uh, so it's not like we can't dis- we we can discount that right like we can forget the fact that he was a neo Nazi when we teach yeah. him uh, yeah. that we have to acknowledge that accept that is that informed his writing and somehow try to make sense of you know those kinds of things at least examine to the extent in which the the author's personal intertwines with their art right because yeah. there's maybe a myriad of different cases. Absolutely. Yeah. And and what is it in that page, Richie, that... Um, oh, yeah, exactly what we were yeah. saying um, on, on the next page, 27, where he's trying to negotiate this identity, where he says, to say any aspect of it is part of me is to say that all of it is part of me. Hmm. Um, and he starts thinking of girls like Reina and countless men with unchecked appetites. He's, you know, he's just, um, again, something that we've been saying since the very first episode of this podcast is Mm -hmm. thinking about the nature of truth and what what we know. And for him coming into the world, he's realizing that, that the world isn't as clean or nice as, you know, what he's known is not quite what other people know Mm -hmm. earlier when they're visiting Raina Mm -hmm. and she mentions the word starving, right? He, he realizes, you know, she means it in a way that, most of my, me and my classmates mm. don't use the word mm-hmm. starving. Yeah. And um, that's just kind of, the, you know, the nature of the book that we're discovering here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's also a way of him developing a, a body of knowledge that is going to counter Dito Manin, right? Who's such a big force and yeah. antagonistic force here, mm-hmm. you know, and, and later on he says, you know, F, F him, right? Like, I'm not going to just listen to him because whatever. Yeah. You know, and so I think it is him taking up that, you know, um, uh, fire inside him that mm. is ultimately going to help him, you know, shape a Promethean flame. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean that's a great that's a great analogy. Well, the the cover of the book is, mm-hmm. you know, that, yeah. that's what I'm really thinking of right there when you yeah. say this. Yeah. Uh, Vanessa, what what about you? What was um, what was another passage that uh you wanted to highlight um when he finds out the hidden identity of the instagram mm. on, on page. that was a cool twist i, I liked it no yeah starting on page 238 um so he's going through instagram and he comes across mia's instagram which leads him to uh what's her name oh my goodness his cousin yeah, his cousin, right? No, not his cousin. Her girlfriend. Oh, um. What's her name? It, isn't it that? Isn't that how it goes? It's Mia, isn't it? Mia or it's, Grace? It's Mia, and then. Oh, okay. So. Grace. He finds Jess's Jess's account first. Mm. Yeah, okay. And then he finds Mia's, and that ultimately leads him oh, to Grace's right. Right. Instagram. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, a little, little Instagram stalking. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, so he's going through, so he requests to follow Grace's Instagram, and then he starts going through all her po- her posts once she accepts the follow request. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so he's going through all her posts, and then um, he sees that it's the same picture that was sent to him through the anonymous account of June's supposed friend. Mm -hmm. And he says, it's the same photo that his friend DM'd me a couple of weeks ago. My mind reels for a moment as the truth dawns on me. There is no friend. Grace sent those DMs. She must have created a fake account to reach out to me to tell me that her brother had done nothing wrong. And that's when he kind of confronts her and they start talking about why she did it. And... Then he kind of, did he, do, 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 do. they talk about how he stopped answering the letters as well. Mm-hmm. And that's why she thought he wouldn't care. Mm-hmm. And then, so he starts asking her about what he found out from Reina about the website. Mm-hmm. And he finds out that 
June was actually the one running the account, posting all the pictures of the families holding pictures of their loved ones that were killed. And so more of that solidarity that, um, you know, just like someone having someone else, you know, being subversive with Tito Manin, right, with the cell phone, uh, that she can also, you know, uh, use this, um, I guess, um, incognito uh, account uh, so that, you know, it's it's her way of at least fighting back, right? Continuing mm-hmm. the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and and so it kind of also brings up a worry for, you know, Jay about, well, you're, you're in danger yeah. though, right? Mm-hmm. You know, what if they do find out who it is? And um, on 242, he says, you know, the right to due process is so ingrained in me that as an American that I've taken it for granted. Up until now, I've never really fully understood that such a right is nothing but ink on paper, paper that can be shredded, paper that can be ignored. And it doesn't take some great evil to do that. The promise of safety is enough. Um, so, you know, the way that this con- the Philippines at this point has been able to uh, have this kind of what we call the surveillance state, mm-hmm. you know, it's not because of like, you know, it kind of goes back to the idea of, of Hannah Arendt's the banality of evil, right? That, you know, Dr. King also said, you know, about for great evil. To uh, triumph. For evil to triumph, right? It doesn't take evil acts. It just takes, like, apathy. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, the idea in this case of, like, you're, you're promised something that it's going to make you more secure as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, 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 the difference here, you know, that in America, at least to this day, you know, we still have the right to do process in, in, on paper. But, of course, you know, in practice, we know that in a lot of cases, like the, the the exonerated five from New York, I don't know if you if you guys, yeah, you know the Central Park five mm-hmm. exonerated, that they didn't have that right. You know they were compelled, they were coerced into testimony that ultimately, you know, um, ruined their lives um, as they were little. A, a little later, um, well, maybe like thirty pages later. Yeah, two sixty five. Okay, me too. <laughs> what about you? What? No, mine's not for another while. Okay. Uh, what What was it, Richie, on two sixty five? Uh, well, it's uh, wondering at the hidden depths, yeah, right, and the flooding and flooding. <laughs> like, that's that's great. I love that part. Uh, I'll I'll, I'll read it. Uh, for the readers, um, I wonder at our hidden depths. Are we all have the same intense ability to love running through us? It wasn't only you and. But for some reason, so many of us don't use it like we did. We keep it hidden. We bury it until it becomes an underground river, until we barely remember it's there, until it's too far down to tap. Why did you choose this one, Richie? Well, he's thinking about our emotional connections that we have with others. Mm -hmm. Um, You see, even just early on in in the book, he has this trouble with this connection. Even with this, with his father, they they, they kind of just don't have this relationship of, of communication, mm-hmm. and I just think throughout this whole experience, he's really thinking about that. You know, what does it mean to be human, and and how how are we connected to others, right? After experiencing all that he's experienced, and kind of questioning what he had known and what he's experiencing, mm-hmm. right? Um, and again, thinking about the, the imagery. Um, that has been being set up of, of water, mm-hmm. right? Um, <clears throat> he uh, he mentions this emotional stuntedness or, or you know, separatedness. Again, thinking of Tito Maining, mm-hmm. Maining the way he kind of runs things. So, like, he's kind of, uh, his, this is his decision here to to actively want to fight that and change that. Be more like Yoon, who seeks those kind of personal connections, who... Mm-hmm changed his whole lifestyle to help someone in Reina, right? Um and then eventually falling in love with her. And I just I just think that approach, right? He, Jay here decides that, you know, before it's too late, he says, right, um how he says it's too far down to tap. Mm-hmm. He says, but maybe it's time to dig it up. Let the sun hit the water to let it flood. Mm-hmm. You know, there's that that flooding imagery that I mentioned uh I mentioned mm-hmm. the quote with the typhoon. Yeah. Right. After yeah. reading Audrey Lord, and then mm-hmm. 
he has the moment on the beach where he's there breathing in the air and he's having these really connected moments mm-hmm. um, where again, zooming out, he's trying to look, think about bigger picture things and how we're all connected. And I think that's just a powerful moment of him putting his foot down and realizing that um, if we don't do anything, that's not going to change. And you mentioned the, the typhoon from the other one. And I think in yours, they didn't mention like the dam bursting uh, with you know the, the Instagram. Yeah. And so I, I really love the the way that imagery, the way that water becomes symbolic in different ways in this mm-hmm. novel. Um, the, <laughs> the, and the, there was another one on, on uh, 281. Yep. I don't know if you had one. Um, but uh, it, it says, you know, um, I don't. So this is when, you know, um, why he was on the list. You know, that we talked about that list, right? The hit list, basically. Mm-hmm. He was on the list because of, um, because of guessing not be. Uh, it's hard to pronounce. So forgive my mispronouncing that, but not because of drugs. That's why he left the woman he loved. So he, she wouldn't be in danger. That may, that may have gotten him on the list. But he told me he ran away from her because he had started using. He did not want to drag her into that life. Um... And, uh, you know, so he kind of has this epiphany here. I don't say anything. I was so close to feeling like I had you and Stoey nailed down. But no, that's not mm-hmm. how stories work, is it? They're shifting things that are reformed and with each new talent transformed with each new talent. Less a solid and more a liquid taking the shape of its con- of its container. Um you know, the way that uh, I mentioned in the first episode, this is a kind of, to me, a postmodern tale because in postmodernism, you know, truth is, is um, in, interrogated, right? What did we mean by it? Uh, how truth can be so complex, contradictory, mm-hmm. et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this imagery again of the water, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you had mentioned this one, Richie, in the, in the pre, pre-recording off the record, but now on the record. Uh, what, what did it remind you of? Oh, right. Yeah. I mean, just from my own personal upbringing, I think of Bruce Lee, you know, who was the great martial artist and movie star, but also a philosopher. Mm-hmm. I studied, he studied philosophy at the University of Washington and, and wrote a lot. And so, one, you know, one of his most famous quotes that people, I think, look up to is when he talks about water, right? We've been talking about that symbolism so far. But when Bruce Lee talks about water, he, you know, he encourages us to be water, my friend. And he, he talks about um, taking the shape of its containers, particularly. Mm-hmm. And that's what I like. He says water is formless. Be formless. That way so you're adaptable and you're, you're, you're mm-hmm. fluid. You have a fluid nature to yourself, right? And, and uh, you know, he says water can drip. It could also crash, you know. And I think there's some, some power in that. And I think relating this again to to the book and what he's experiencing right this this idea of of, of uh Yoon's story you can't just take a hold of it like water mm-hmm. right depending on your perspective that's going to change right depending on the mm-hmm. vessel what mm-hmm. what your what uh filter exactly. you're getting it through exactly yeah yeah very powerful um did you have thoughts on that Vanessa or, or did you have um well, mine come about comes a little bit later. Okay, but it ties. It still ties into like the same thing. What page is it on? On two ninety one. So this is um after the conversation with Tito, Daniel. Mm-hmm. And um Jay is kind of questioning how he feels about June now that he knows all of these new things. And so he asks um Grace how she feels. I'm going to read a quote from um, Grace first, and then one that she says a while later. So it says, Just because we didn't know everything about him doesn't change what we did know about him, Kuya. What Tito Daniel told us, it made made me question what I could have done to help, but but it did not change how I feel about my brother. He was human, she says without hesitation. He was struggling. He was struggling. Just because he was a user, a user, a pusher, it doesn't mean that his life was worthless. It doesn't mean that there wasn't good in him. And so I like that she didn't really change 
what how she felt about him mm -hmm. even though she knew all of these things she still knew that he was a good person mm -hmm. and that he was trying to make change in the world mm -hmm. and whatever that change you know was was cut short mm -hmm. you know and again just like Khalil right that he he gets uh involved you know and uh you know being a user and it's kind of again the the negative perception that we have of people who use drugs and um that that itself doesn't mean you know that they're worthless right that that they don't mm -hmm. matter right mm -hmm. but they do uh and i think again just like in the philippines it's it's in america i think we have the same view towards drugs you know going back to the 60s and, and nixon's drug war that's yeah. still going on to this day you know uh and yeah just to a lot of larger extent poverty and I think mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite poets, uh, Guante, Kyle, Kyle Tran, mm -hmm. he has uh, a couple pieces on that. And he says, I'm sick and tired of acting like only poor people have bad intentions, you know. And he's, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. the, because at this point, with the, the quote you're talking about, he's thinking about like the system mm -hmm. as a whole, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right, that fails a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things um, I'm sure you're going to bring that up, right, on 290. Yeah, so yeah. like towards yeah. the middle of the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so she talk. she starts talking about how she and June used to talk about like what was going on with the government in terms of the drug war. Mm -hmm. Um, and so she tells him June's solution for all of it. And it says, he said that those suffering from addiction needed to be helped not to be arrested because their addiction was as much genetics as it was a choice. And that those pushing needed to be employed, not to be killed because most of them were only trying to survive. He also said that none of these drugs could even make their way into our country to begin with if it were not for corrupt people in power. So they needed to be replaced, not re-elected. Um, very, very um, uh, astute uh, you know, observation, right? And mm -hmm. I think it's not unrealistic. You know, um, I think, um, you know, I... He, he speaks truth, you know, truth to power mm -hmm. there that mm -hmm. that's exactly what I think we need. You know, it's it's not about this kind of uh, of, of way of, of punishing people, but instead of getting them help, you know, because it's, mm -hmm. it's a mental concern. It's not about crime. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a criminal one. Um, and uh, I think it also reminds me of uh, determinism. You know, he mentions genes mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. much genes play a role in what we do, you know, like what you like, what you have uh, an inclination to. And, you know, Which, um, yeah. everything begins and ends at the Kentucky Club. I'm thinking of chasing the dragon mm. in that sense, right? Mm. The yeah, yeah. Predisposition maybe to addic ad addiction. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, whether you like salty food or, or sugary exactly. food, right? That's genes too. And mm -hmm. everything else, you know, in some sense, all of it, everything could be boiled down to determinism. The idea that we don't have free will, which is controversial, but, you know, there's some evidence for, for believing it. Um, and uh, it makes it even more of a, the crime here then becomes not June and his acts, but him not getting it out from the government, right? Not yeah. having that safety net. Yeah, well, I mean, it points to, like, when someone's pointing at the problem, there's, like, a larger issue or structure involved. Again, I think of Bruce Lee when, he, in one of the films, he's teaching a student, and he's trying to get him, and he, and he ultimately, his lesson is, you know, it's like a finger pointing at the moon. If you focus on, on the finger, you'll miss all that heavenly glory. You're kind of missing the whole picture, mm -hmm. uh, what's beyond there. And so he, this section he's pointing at, hey, we need to change this at a policy level, governmental level. Um, that's what I was trying to mention right now with the, like, that quote, you know, like when it comes to drugs and drug war, a lot, oftentimes it's the poor mm -hmm. who are caught in the brunt of it. But I'm, you know, just as much it's people in power, too, that are probably using mm -hmm. and abusing, but they're more guarded. Um, so it's about changing these systems. I'm thinking of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because we, you know, just celebrated MLK mm -hmm. Day. Mm -hmm. um, he, you know, he talks about the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? Coming across someone and helping them. But he points out that, you know, we often refer to it as this good virtue, this thing. But why don't we, again, as you've been saying this episode, zoom out 
and and question why is the road this way Mm -hmm. and that this stranger needs this help we Mm -hmm. need to look at the bigger picture here and what we can do Mm -hmm. exactly right because he's not the only one Mm -hmm. yeah um what else vanessa did you want to chime in with well it's all of the chapter um all the darkness in the world and it's um when jay and grace finally convinced the family that it's a good idea to have a funeral for yeah, june after lots of family drama mm-hmm. <laughs> um so that chapter is just the funeral but i liked there was a really i i thought this was a really strong line mm-hmm. on page 297 um mm. and it says he's listening to everyone talk about june and then there's a sentence where he says, It is a strange thing to mourn in another language, but I figure everyone will probably speak in their own language tonight. And though I want to ask for translation, I won't, because their words are not for me. And I found that that was really interesting, because even though he wants to know people's memories of June, mm-hmm. he's not going to ask for it mm. in that time, because he knows that it's not about him right now. It's about someone else. Mm-hmm. And so he knows that it's like not a thing to do. And for this kind of occasion, right, of, you know, you know, brings in a lot of people that you don't know. And, um, you know, we, we've been exposed to a lot of different kinds of funerals in the Kentucky Club um, where sometimes they're not even mourning. But in this mm-hmm. one, it, it, it's that sense of, of privacy that, you know, just like you said, right, I'm not the center of attention mm-hmm. here. And I should respect the right of people who s- to say their words without me just like having that need to know what mm-hmm. is being said. Yeah, I really like that, too. Uh, really shows that, again, you know, he's clearly very, very mature at this point. Mm-hmm. A lot of... Uh personal life truths being realized and also you know like in addition to that mm-hmm. you know um his his attempt to to think about emotion and our emotional stuntedness right he talks about tears that that hurt but also heal because it's part of that process mm-hmm. of, of healing being able to accept that and it's a victory because right? like, it's a family that's mm-hmm. kind of closed off a lot mm-hmm. you know? mm-hmm. so to have this moment yeah it, it is that moment of, of redemption almost for for Yoon and to some degree Jay, right? Because now he, I mean, this isn't this a, doesn't solve anything, and it's just one day. But you know, to to bring the family, to, it's kind of ironic too, right? That it's it took a funeral to bring the family together mm-hmm. in this way, right? And yeah. acknowledge you know June's existence, even. Um, yeah. So I I. That was, uh, you know, very important. Um, was there something else about that? Pa- um, not that passage, but like right after. Mm-hmm. Um, so Tito Manning ends up going to the funeral as well, even though he was completely against it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so on the chapter, a C on page 302. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like this one because he's talking about how it, this is only like, one step towards all of them understanding each other and being closer as a family. And so he says, I know that June's memorial probably isn't going to make him turn his back on enforcing his president's policies overnight, but maybe it planted a seed. Mm -hmm. And I really liked that line because um, it shows that Jay went there to kind of make this change and find out what was happening and find out more about his cousin. Mm-hmm. But then we look back and his white lie was also to know more about his family. And so he's finally doing that and he's seeing that he can make the change and it can start in his family alone. Yeah. <clears throat> it reminded me a lot of that line about, you know, they tried to bury us. They didn't know that we were seeds. Mm-hmm. I can't remember who said it, but um, it's kind of like a proverb. Yeah, now, right? yeah, that's how I think it. I've seen it attributed as a Mexican proverb. Yeah, uh, that sometimes that's all it takes, right? And it goes back to um, hate, uh, hate, uh, hate you give about you know the rose growing mm. from concrete. Mm-hmm. 
you know yeah. uh, that's yeah. sometimes all it takes um I think you ha- you all have this one too about the 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 name of the novel, right? The pattern seems to nothing, and like uh, you know, where did that name come from? And we get that from uh, Yun's letter, mm-hmm. and uh, the idea of pattern saints is, is a big thing with Catholics, and mm-hmm. you know, it, it's kind of a funny little lighthearted moment about you know, there's a saint for everything. It seems right, just like nowadays, there's a nap for everything. Catholics have a saint for everything. You know, lost causes, mm-hmm. etc. Um, and uh, he figures that he's gonna name himself the patron saint of nothing. Um, and my strong line for that was how uh, Jay feels about it. Mm-hmm. You know that um, I drift off to sleep thinking of my cousin, of humanity and its problems, of oceans and islands. I imagine both of us, patron saints of nothing. Did you guys want to? Did you guys have this one too? The I didn't, but I know it's a really important part of the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it it's kind of interesting, right? The idea of nothingness that that is what he chooses to represent. That is what he chooses to be mm-hmm. uh, remembered by. But um, I think if any, it, 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 it's again going back to the idea of truth that you know he. In some sense, his family has seen him as nothing, right? Mm. And it's almost kind of foreshadowing that. And maybe it's like how he feels that Mm -hmm. to his family he is nothing, right? Mm. And that's why, you know, again, he had to send it to his father. But but he really isn't, right? Through uh, Jay's work, he's been able to be something that he really was right not something that he was not which was what Tito Manning wanted him to be Mm -hmm. and then I just had the end so I don't know if if any of you had what did you have Mm. Vanessa about it I just like how he starts um, when he's talking to his dad how he kind of confesses everything Mm. um which page was well, he, he breaks through, right? You know, like yeah, and his dad is actually listening to him, and then, um, they get home, and then his dad is, says, "You probably want to take a rest now." He says, "I drop my backpack by the door. Actually, I'm all right." He's quiet for a beat, then asks, "Coffee?" "Yeah, okay." And then they kind of continue the conversation rather than ending it just because they got home and it was just the discussion they were having on the car ride home. Mm -hmm. It's like it becomes something more and his dad is really curious about what he found out. And, uh, and and a very, again, um, you know, very accepting, right? Uh, father that, you know, this is, he's not going to take it back. He's not going to like do what Tito Manin did to, you know, you and right. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's going to support him. Uh, and I really like that last main paragraph in that page. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are good things I can hold on to, and there are other things I have the power to change. My family, myself, mm-hmm. this world, all of us are flawed. But flawed doesn't mean hopeless. It doesn't mean forsaken. It doesn't mean lost. We are not doomed to suffer things as they are, silent and alone. We do not have to leave questions and let letters and lives unanswered. We have more power and potential than, than we know if we would only speak, if we would only listen. And to me, uh, again, I, I know I mentioned it already several times, but it reminded me a lot of, you know, The Hate You Give, that similar ending. And also Poet X to some degree, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you have a voice, you should use it. And, yeah. and you have ears as well, you should listen. And the power that we have within us, right? Because sometimes we really do feel powerless we feel of course flawed you know but he i really like how he kind of puts a different way of looking at all that um did you guys have any thoughts on on that well i that was also like my strong paragraph i really liked that one as well um again it does tie into both of those books yeah um i guess it's it just kind of reiterates the I guess overall theme of this novel, that paragraph, um, being being what, the, just how one? people. Well, I guess like using your voice and mm. 
not being afraid to find out the truth about something that you're curious about. Mm -hmm. Like, don't like be more involved, I guess, in society, not just how it starts off being like, oh, it's a lot of like, I just read the headlines and that's it. Mm -hmm. And now he's really involved in like the rest of his culture and like where he comes from or half of where he comes from. Mm -hmm. And he makes that decision, right, that he's going to go back, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, he's, he's kind of always been hesitant on, on what he's going to do next. Mm-hmm. They always say college, but, you know, again, he hasn't known. So, uh, yeah, once he's kind of more convinced mm-hmm. that there's more for him still over mm-hmm. there, that's mm-hmm. a nice conviction. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's a beautiful ending that, like you said, Vanessa, yeah. really wraps up the theme mm-hmm. and the... Uh, you know, gives us something to look forward to as far as uh, Jay's story, you know, and kind of, you know, Yoon himself kind of closes that book in his story, his life story in a way that is satis- is very satisfying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I hope, it, you know, all of y'all who listened uh, were, uh, if you haven't picked up this book, you, you really should. And... Um, uh, there's uh, hopefully y'all enjoyed you know listening to us um, talking about what what struck us you know but like we said we aren't the only ones um, but uh, Vanessa did you wanna uh, just reiterate the the social media accounts that we have and and what what the next book is that we have in line yeah 